I too would like to congratulate the kids that uh, were involved in contests yesterday. Um, I'm going to go a little further than that. Uh, if you were involved in contests yesterday, would you please stand up? And maybe some Newell Fonda kids have been involved in contests. Uh, please stand up if you're involved. <laughs> We hear and see so many bad things about kids and adults, but it's sure good to see something good that uh, our kids are doing. So keep it up, kids. We appreciate it. All right, would you please open your hymnals to 625, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Please stand if you can. We'll sing all three verses. This week in my quiet times, I'm reading from the Gospel of John, and it has been so refreshing and so encouraging, especially in conjunction with a series, a TV series that we've been watching called The Chosen. How many of you have seen that? I don't know. It's um, pretty good and pretty encouraging. Um, certainly a lot of artistic license in that video series, but, but also very, very well done. Anyway, so normally when I'm doing my quiet times, I'm doing some underlining or I'm doing some stars next to verses, maybe circling the verses. But I keep noticing, of course, in the Gospel of John, the word believe. And every time I see that word, I'm circling it. And so often throughout the Gospel, you see that word repeated. Well, in John chapter 9, we read of this man that was born blind. And one of my favorite verses stood out to me in this passage. As he passed by, Jesus saw a blind man from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? This, of course, was the tradition that was common in that day. Jesus answered, it was not this man that sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him but that the works of God might be displayed in him. 
We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and then anointed the man's hands with the mud. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And he went and washed and came back seeing. And after this, this man testifies to his neighbor, his neighbors. And following that, he testifies to the religious elite in verse 24 and 25. So the second time they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man, that is Jesus, is a sinner. And he answered, he said, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. But one thing I do know, that I was blind, but now I see. In verse 30, God uses the healed man to testify to the religious. He uses this man who was born blind to speak truth to those who were spiritually blind. This man says in verse 30, the man answered, why? This is an amazing thing. You did not know where he comes from and where, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of a God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opens the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, they said, You were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And it says, They cast him out. As we keep reading the next couple of verses here, it says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and he is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. I found it very interesting that the religious elite kicked this man out. He was outcast by religion. But Jesus, in the very next verse, or the very next maybe two verses later, he seeks this man out to help him come to a place of not only belief, but worship. Worshiping the Son of God for who he is. And maybe that is where you are. Maybe you have been outcast by religion. Isaiah spoke of this. He said that the Lord is gathering Jews and Gentiles, even the outcast. The Bible says the Lord God who gathers the outcast of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. And I love how God gathers those outcast by the religion of human achievement, and he calls them to belief and to worship. Would you join us now as we, as we worship that risen Savior? The PowerPoint working now, Alan? Okay, all right. Would you stand and join us? Remembering that he alone is healer.
sing, but would you join me in prayer? Lord, today we ask your blessing on the preaching of your word. We recognize that, that the word of God is living and active, that it is sharper than any two-edged sword, that it, that it penetrates to the division of soul and marrow, judges the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Lord, we thank you for the word of God and its ability to transform our lives from the inside out. Um, so, Lord, thank you for it. Thank you for those ancient words, those ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the people of God here at Faith Bible that continue to lift it up in order that you might be glorified in our lives. So we continue worshiping you now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
As I said earlier, we've been watching that series called The Chosen, and, um, you know, Simon is trying to, to run his own life, and they embellish it a little bit more, of course, as, as uh, movies usually do, but he's doing all kinds of, let's just say, shady things behind the scenes, control his own destiny, and um, then he's face to face with this this guy that Andrew has been telling him about. And the first time he sees him is when, you know, he catches this great multitude of fish. And as the story goes in the Gospels, Simon says, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a, a sinful man. And I think the more that we get closer to the Lord, the more we confess who we are as sinners and declare His worth and that we are unworthy. Does that make sense? God is so gracious and that uh, scene was particularly moving for me. Now, normally I have some great introduction, but today we're going to pick up with something very important that I missed in Acts chapter 15. So would you join me there? If you look to the title of Acts chapter 15, uh, right above where it says 15, there normally it says something like Jerusalem Council or the Council at Jerusalem. We're reminded that, that those titles of chapters are not an inspired part of the text. They were added later on um, in English translations to help us um, have good summaries, but we also notice that the word council is not mentioned in chapter 15 either. And I guess up until this point, I didn't realize that that, that was the case. Um, the title of my message early in chapter 15 summarizes the subject of this meeting the pandemic of legalism. In verse 6, we see that the apostles and the elders, they gather together to address the question, what must one do to be saved? And the result is that the people of God are united around the doctrine of salvation, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And what I missed until this week is the fact that Acts chapter 15 does not mention the church council per se, nor any sort of denominational supreme court. In fact, every local assembly of, of believers in those early Christian and early Christianity was self-governing and autonomous. Well, there have been a lot of councils, church councils, that have convened. Um, especially in the early church, to affirm sound doctrine, but also to refute um, false doctrine. The truth is, after about 450 A.D., there is more heresy promoted by church councils than there is sound doctrine. Instead of a denominational head, we read in chapter 14, verse 23, that um, they... Um, Paul and Barnabas had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting. They committed them to the Lord in whom they have believed. And these elders are sufficient for the governing of the church. Before the completion of the New Testament, of course, it was right and it was good for the church to consult the apostles as well as the elders to clarify sound doctrine. And remember that but anyway, even here, we recognize that Peter's advice in Acts 15 is held in equal weight to that of Barnabas, who is not an apostle, as well as, um, let's see, who else is here? Um, James. And remember that in Acts chapter 12, the apostle James had been martyred by King Agrippa. 
So we are talking, instead of an apostle, we are talking about the half-brother of Jesus, the same one who wrote the epistle titled James, not the apostle. So Peter's advice is just as valid as that of Paul and Barnabas and James. Even the letter that resulted, beginning of verse 23, there's no sense of an elite body that is dictating all kinds of regulations, but rather they offer a combined judgment of the group in an, uh, an advisory capacity. And I say this because the book of Acts is a transitional book. And throughout the book of Acts, we see the apostles transitioning to local church leadership, i.e. the elders who um, are appointed here in uh, verse 23. So the truth is that each church was directly responsible to the Lord through the elders. And that is abundantly clear, beginning in Revelation chapter 1, the first few chapters of, of the book of Revelation, when, when the um, lampstand represents the elders who are responsible for every church. So, so I come back to this before we move on to chapter 16, because number one, I have observed that the autonomy of a local church is important because it keeps liberalism out of the church. How many of you have seen that in your time? Liberalism is um, a shift away from a consistent literal interpretation of Scripture. And when sound doctrine is destroyed because of liberalism, morality always follows. As one commentator says, the purest testimony for God has been maintained by churches that are free from outside human domination. The second benefit of local autonomy is that it hinders the government from trying to control the church. Many churches around the world are still um, under discriminatory COVID restrictions, despite the fact that in most cases, it is unconstitutional. Around the world, we observe that when churches are united under denominational leaders, those leaders tend to capitulate to the totalitarian to a totalitarian government. During the Third Reich, Hitler, for example, tried to silence pastors and force churches into a union and conformity to promote Nazi propaganda. Today, denominations capitulate to, to the LGBT group, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, Antifa, and many other socialist Marxist gospels rather than the actual gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ. So throughout history, when a church is autonomous, when they are self-governing, it is much easier for them to go underground during times of persecution. And the work of, of transforming lives from the inside out, the work of the gospel thrives in times like those, in times of persecution, rather than being stomped out. And this is especially true concerning a hostile gov government. So just to say in Acts chapter 15, uh, there is neither a papal decree, a decree from a pope, nor is there a denominal dictatorship, so to speak, but rather in Acts 15, their conclusion is that no one has the right to require of the Gentiles something that God does not. Peter, for example, in verse 8, as we've looked at before, he concludes, Brothers, you know that in the early days God has made a choice among you that by the mouth of the Gentiles they should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as He did to us. And He made no distinction between us Jews and them Gentiles, having cleansed their heart by faith. And He says very clearly in verse 10, now, therefore, why are you putting 
Why are you putting God to test to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor they have been able to bear? But we believe that we'll be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. So after this meeting, Paul and Barnabas, they desire to get back this, um, what I have called, what a lot of people call this council meeting. Um, Paul and Barnabas now get back to their passion and priority of the Word of God. And we see that beginning in verse 36. Actually, we see it in verse 35 as well. Pardon Barnabas, Barnabas, they remained in Antioch. They are faithful to carry that letter there, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought it best not to take them Take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches." Now, this week, I, was, I read a story of two porcupines in the North Woods. They were trying to huddle together in order to keep from freezing to death. When they get close, their quills pricked each other, and they would move apart. They needed each other for warmth, but they needled each other with their sharp quills. They wanted to get close but the needles were in the way. Sometimes church members can be like porcupines, right? We see that here at the end of chapter 15. We need each other, but there are also other times that we needle each other. As one man said, there are many porcupine Christians out there. They have their good points, but you can't get near them. Maybe you've known Christians like that. They have their good points, but you can't get near them. This week I was reminded of the serious nature of Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17, that we would be perfectly one, perfectly one, so that the world may know that you, Father, have sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. In 1 John chapter 4 verse 20, the beloved apostle, he says, he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So looking to Mark's abandonment of Paul last week, we saw that we should never make the mistake of saying, well, Paul's a spiritual giant. That guy is a spiritual giant. He will just be fine, right? Instead, our default is to look to the Lord's faithfulness and emulate it. Now, I should mention that also that Mark looked to Paul as being, uh, excuse me, that most look to Paul as being right because in verse 41, he and Silas alone are commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. That being said, one can be right and fail to communicate it rightly. So last time we saw that when responding to conflict, we should pray, be humble, seek peace, right? Seek the wisdom of God instead of the wisdom of the world. Listen to the problem, try to reach a consensus if possible, and vote as our Constitution allows. Most importantly, when porcupine quills get sharp, like they did in the end of Acts chapter 15, we must guard the reputation of Christ and strive to have unity among a diversity of opinions. So the good news is that instead of one missionary team, now there's two, right? So we have um, Barnabas and John Mark. They're going one direction. Last week, we saw Paul's new partner, Silas, that he is 
has a background of both Greek and Roman. And we begin today in chapter 16, verse 1. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple is there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews that were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. And so verse 5, the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in number daily. So last week we looked at Paul's priority and passion in the Word, and today we, get, we, get, we look at the right personnel for ministry and the right preparations for ministry as they embark on their second missionary journey. Like Paul and Silas, Timothy also had Jewish heritage, a Jewish heritage and a Roman citizenship. Timothy was likely in his late teens or early 20s. And so right at the outset of, of looking into who Timothy is, there is a great point of application that we can look at today. Our primary responsibility as a church is what? To glorify God, right? And like right after that, whether we're serving on the praise team or the elder board, whatever team that you're serving on, our goal should always be to include training for the next generation to hand off the torch before it goes out, right? What a great point of application. That's exactly what Paul is doing here. He's committing to training Timothy. Next, we see that Timothy was the son of a believing Jewish woman and his father was a Greek. It's likely that his mother and grandmother were converts during Paul's first missionary journey when he came to, through Lystra, Timothy's hometown. This Timothy is the same one that Paul wrote two letters to, two letters that we have today in our Bible, First and Second Timothy. So join me in 2 Timothy for a moment. And while you're turning there, um, because of the tense of the verb that is used to describe Timothy's Roman father, it's likely that he had died at some point in the past. Perhaps he was called to go to war. We don't know. But like Paul and Silas, um, Timothy was, he was Jewish, he would have access to synagogue, but also as a Roman, he would have access to Roman transportation and, and Roman centers of philosophy. And throughout the book of Acts, the Lord uses his background for opening up the sharing, the sharing of the gospel. And by way of application, we too should, should never look to a person's ethnic background nor discriminate as it relates to to joining hand in hand in ministry. But concerning his mother and grandmother, we read in 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, Paul says, with a clear conscience, as I remembered you consistently in my prayers night and day. Do you see how Paul is, what is he doing? He has been pouring out He's passing on the torch. He is pouring out his heart to the Lord on behalf of this young man, Timothy. As I, remind, as I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith. The root word is hypocrisy. We get our English word hypocrisy from um, Hypocritas, and that word is negated by the letter A in English or alpha at the beginning. So it's 
Timothy is a guy that is without hypocrisy. He has a genuine or authentic faith, okay? And this faith, we read, is a faith that dwelt first um, in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. This word, I'm sure, um, means to be persuaded or convinced. And for this reason, he says, I want to remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. So obviously, Lois, his grandmother, and Eunice, his mother, they heard the good news. They did not keep it to themselves at home. They went back, shared it, their son, grandson, and he too trusted in Christ as Savior. Now, contrary to what our sweet, sweet Mary said during Pastor Appreciation Month, one of my favorite Mother's Day messages is about Lois and Eunice, not about Jezebel. Nor Samson's wife, Delilah, who was an absolute peach of a woman. Nor was it about Job's wife. After all, as we know, God, well, Satan, excuse me, Satan took all that belonged to Job. Took all of his kids, took all of the wealth that he had, all of the camels and oxen and donkeys. And, And I think it's, he had a reason that he left his wife alive. His wife, whose best advice to him was, well, curse God and die. I can just imagine being Job on the way out the door and receiving this wonderful instruction from his wife. And, okay, honey, have a nice day, you know. But anyway, um, one of my favorite Mother's Day messages is looking to the example of Lois, the grandmother, and Eunice, a single mom, a widowed mother. There are a couple of young ladies, they are leading by example. They are placing God's word as priority. And because Timothy had the right foundation of faith, he was useful to the Lord. He was the right hand of Paul, who was the greatest missionary except for Jesus Christ who ever lived. And there are many places throughout the New Testament that we see how the Lord used Timothy. So 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, for example, um, Paul commends Timothy to teach the people at Corinth. He writes, For this reason I have sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, and he will remind you of my ways which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul sends Timothy to the believers in Thessalonica. Therefore, we could, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left in Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker in the gospel. Listen to that for a moment. The Apostle Paul calls Timothy God's fellow worker. Is there a greater commendation than that? And the verse continues... God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith so that no one would be destroyed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. And then in Philippians chapter, chapter 2, Paul says in verse 22 to, or 19 to 22, But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else. Listen to what Paul says about this young guy who's likely in his early 20s. I have no one else of a kindred spirit who is genuinely concerned for your welfare. What a great commendation. 
He says, for they all seek after their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you are of, of his proven worth. And he uh, served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. And then again in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13, um, this letter is addressed to Timothy and Paul. He was under house arrest. He, was, he asked Timothy to bring him his cloak, his books, and especially his parchment, parchments. So Timothy has been set free by the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was trained in the Hebrew scriptures by his grandmother, Lois, his mother, Eunice. And now he's been saved by grace. And um, what I love about, as you look at the, 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 the whole picture of Timothy's life, think about it for a moment. Not a lot of jobs for single moms in the first century or grandmothers. We don't know if she had any other children. And yet, she has absolutely no problem with saying, Lord, Timothy is yours. Have you said that as a parent? I have a hard time with that. You know, like whenever one of my girl says, I want to be a missionary in Africa. You know? But I encourage you that the greatest calling that they can have in their life is furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it is eternal in nature. Have you prayed that prayer concerning your son or your daughter? Are you training them to go out, uh, to be equipped, to be used greatly of the Lord in their world? Well, going back to Acts chapter 16, verse 2 now, um, to wrap up here, we, we see that the reason Paul took him along was because he was well spoken of. He was martyreo by the brothers. Um, this is the same word that is used in Acts chapter 6 whenever they were looking for um, men to help serve the widows. They were martyreo. They had a good testimony and they were full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And so this is not some worldly reputation like being really well known for being a great speaker or whatever else. He had a good testimony. In fact, every, almost every single place that this word is used in the New Testament, it, it's describing bearing witness to Jesus Christ. And Timothy is a young man who has the reputation of upholding the witness of Jesus Christ. And as we look now at the preparation in verse 3, why was it necessary for Paul to circumcise Timothy? Hadn't they already clarified that circumcision was not necessary for salvation nor for sanctification? Yes. Was this time, was this some sort of capitulation to legalism? No. There's nothing implied that it had to do with Timothy's salvation or sanctification. Rather, if Timothy had not been circumcised, Jews of that day would have assumed that, that he had renounced his Jewish heritage. It was very common in that day. It's called Hellenization. Um, so Paul's desire was to, to avoid any unnecessarily stumbling blocks that could possibly stand in the way of Jewish evangelism. Additionally, Timothy's circumcision would grant him full access into the synagogues that Paul and Silas would later visit. And by way of application here, believers must be sensitive to the characteristics of, of the very culture that they're trying to reach so as to avoid unnecessary offense. Some of our friends um, have a work environment that is very multicultural, and they are 
constantly having people over um, to their house who are Hindu and Muslim. And so when they have them over for meals, they're very careful to honor their customs. But at the same time, they never shy away from, from sharing their faith in Jesus Christ. They never shy away from giving thanks to the Lord in the name of Jesus for the meal that they're going to partake of. They never compromise their biblical standards. So, reasonable preparations. So the result of having a passion and priority of the word and having uh, reliable personnel and making reasonable preparations is that there is an increase in spiritual maturity among the believers. We see that in uh, chapter 16, verse 4 and 5, especially verse 5. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. You, you also see, jumping back to chapter 15, verse 41, that they were strengthened they strengthen the churches. And I did a little bit of research concerning this word as well. It's used in chapter 3, verse 16, um, to describe the strength that came to the lame beggar's ankles and feet when he was healed. Strengthening him. And he un- instantly stood up. They were not growing strong as a church, by watering down the gospel. They were not growing stronger by entertaining the masses with concerts and comedy shows and etc. Obviously, those things all have a time and a place, but, but rather, this team of three guys, their message, chapter 15, verse 36, is proclaiming the Word of God and in doing so, proclaiming the God of the Word. They communicate the gospel message that salvation from sin's penalty is by grace through faith in what Jesus did upon the cross. And that was strengthening to the church. And Lord willing, next week we're going to look at the, a fourth man who joins this team who is a physician, who's the author of the gospel of Luke as well as the book we're reading right now, Acts of the Apostles, and the encouragement, the strengthening that he contributed to the Apostle Paul throughout his ministry. And that brings us to some of the last words that the Apostle wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. As we consider the life of Timothy and Paul passing off the torch not too long before he died, he writes, You, however, have have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, Timothy, Timothy, listen to my words. But as for you, continue in what you have learned. And have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus, Christ Jesus. He says, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correcting, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. The Word of God equips us perfectly and completely.
for every good work. Would you join me in prayer? Oh, Lord, um, thank you for what we've learned about the autonomy of a local church and uh, its importance. Lord, thank you so much for the ways that you have helped us to understand how to deal with conflict biblically. And I pray that um, you'd help us to apply these truths. Lord, that, that we, like Lois and Eunice, would be faithful at home and as a church to equip young people that we might send out Timothys into this world. And Lord, we're praying for the next generation that you would raise up a group of young people who are on fire with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they, they understand the importance of sharing that gospel, that people might come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, that they might be saved from the eternal punishment of hell. So, Lord, we're praying for that next generation, that we would have the privilege of sending out into the world some full-time missionaries and pastors, but also people who are consistently sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in the workplace. We recognize that this doesn't happen by accident, so Lord... Um, Find us faithful. Find us faithful until you come to catch up your bride, the church, away to meet you in the air. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.